So happy to be here talking about unknown knowns or the knowledge that doesn't know itself. Another way to describe that idea is to say that sometimes the way we see a problem becomes the obstacle to a solution. My name is Emily Green, and I'm going to talk about fixing school lunches because it's a tremendous example of that idea. And you're going to see, I hope, that if you step back with me and look at some of the assumptions we have about how lunches are delivered, we can find a very different way to provide them. So here's a lunch. Uh, I, I swear. <laughs> That's a fish cake. That's some really tired looking peas. The, uh, the blob on the lower left, that uh, it's supposed to be tartar sauce, that's uh, peaches and sugar syrup, and of course, it's the ubiquitous box of chocolate milk. This is from a website, a very depressing one, in which American students upload photos of their own school lunches. This is not the best looking lunch on that website, but it is by no means the worst looking lunch. In other words, it is representative. But um, if you had one word to describe this lunch, even though it's food, even though it has some nutritional value, I think that word would be most likely to be nasty. To understand how we got to that styrofoam tray with that dead looking food, we need to take a short trip back to the 19th century. So when the Industrial Revolution came along and factories exploded, they drew their workers from nearby farms. And those workers went home for lunch. Factory owners started to think, damn, this is not very effective. And the first in-factory cafeterias were born to keep workers at the factory and maximize the productivity of a factory. It was not long at all. This start took off in New England. And it was not long at all before the city of Boston was one of the very first places that adopted school lunches on site as a way to make the school day more efficient as well. And it took off from there. So after the Great Depression in 1946, it was Harry Truman who thought that the US government should help offset the cost of those lunches by creating the National School Lunch Program for low-income children. So if we fast forward to 2014, there are over 30 million kids in the United States that get their lunch at school, either full price or free or reduced through subsidies uh, funded by US taxpayers. So what's happened is that process of supplying lunch for 30 million children every day has turned into a big business. It's enormously complex for schools and school districts. So there has been a whole industrial sector that has arisen. Aramark, Sodexo, Compass Group, three companies that just alone, just the three of them in one year, made $40 billion from creating industrial food programs for schools and also for hospitals. Some unintended consequences have arisen. This is one. This is 57 tons of sugar. And it represents the amount of sugar that the children of the LA school district eat just from chocolate milk in one week, which works out to 24 packets of sugar per child for one week from chocolate milk. All right, so sugar is not the only enemy in uh, massively produced school lunches. It's salt and other preservatives, because those things make it easier for large organizations to uh, manage the logistics of delivering meals. But we're not done. We have this. This is a bonus food. The National School Lunch Program doesn't just help schools produce lunches by subsidizing them with tax dollars. They also give schools free food. Good idea, right? Agriculture in the United States is very efficient. We have all this food. Sometimes the market doesn't want the food we make, so let's give it to our kids. This is called finely textured beef. Have you seen it before? It's actually scrap meat and cartilage that's been treated with chemicals so that it can be blended into a really viscous substance that's then formed into patties and hot dogs. Right? And it's provided for free for schools. Because of some recent activism around the quality of, poor quality of school lunches, it's been renamed Pink Slime. So if you went on right now and Googled Pink Slime, you would see a raft of images, many more disgusting than this one. And because of that activism, it's starting to fade out of school menus. But it does represent a lot of other industrial food that shows up in school lunches because it's cheap. Not because it's good, but because it's cheap. 
So we have another problem, and that has to do with fresh fruits and vegetables. The more we learn about nutrition in the 21st century, the more we understand the role of micronutrients that are in fresh fruits and vegetables. However, those are very expensive to deploy through massive lunch programs. And if you don't do it with some care, kids who are unaccustomed to seeing fresh fruits and vegetables will throw them away, which means a lot of waste. So the solution that the US government has come up with is to call this a vegetable. Right? You are looking at ketchup. Yes, OK, good. Um, <laughs> and the second most common ingredient in ketchup after tomatoes is sugar. sugar. Yes, right. So we haven't really solved the problem. We've just engaged in some really seriously delusional thinking. <laughs> so um, the last problem that I want to mention before we move into looking at solutions is one that's a relatively recent one. And that is the rise of food allergies. From 1997 to 2011, the CDC says that there was a 50% rise in food allergies in children in the United States. Now, I don't know why that is, but I do know that that means that one in 13 children today has a serious food allergy, and that works out to about two kids in every American classroom. If you add to that the fact that we are now getting a little bit more culturally sensitive to very legitimate dietary preferences like vegetarianism, veganism, keeping kosher, eating halal meats. It's almost impossible for a cafeteria with two or three lunch choices a day to meet the needs of an entire classroom, right? Meanwhile, food costs are going up, largely driven by transportation costs. But we're starting to understand that we don't just want to feed kids. We want to feed them with something of quality. There is absolutely no doubt that people are working on this problem. But the real issue is that nobody's happy right now. So at the high end of an economic spectrum in a school, kids whose parents can afford to give them something better do. They bring a lunch, one that they made or bought elsewhere, or they use the vending machines, or they um, go off campus if they're allowed to do that at some schools. The worst solution, of course, is that they opt out of this program and opt out of lunch entirely and don't eat lunch. And the program falls on the low end because the kids who can opt out economically do, and that leaves the low-income students taking the school lunch. And that becomes a stigma because only the poor kids eat the school lunch. So kids opt out because they don't want to be stigmatized as poor. That means that the enormous expense that schools go through, either doing it lunch themselves or paying somebody like Aramark to do it for them, is wasted. Wasted space, wasted food, wasted money in an environment where we care more about education than we used to, and we want to see those schools doing something better with the resources they have. So there's no question that there are a lot of people that are working on this problem. This is not a problem that I discovered by myself. Certainly, the dialogue over the last five years has been growing louder and louder. And you have people like Michelle Obama and Jamie Oliver working on it at a national level. And here in Boston, you have a really dedicated group of local chefs and food and education experts that have been getting together for two years now and coming up with ideas to support the improvement of lunches in Boston and Cambridge. And they're doing lots of great things. They're great ideas. They're building farms on school land and teaching kids about the value of fruits and vegetables and being able to use those in the meals. They're upgrading the quality of kitchens at schools so that more sophisticated food preparation can be done. And they're hiring chefs in schools who care about actually cooking and not reheating food. And they're lobbying to get the National School Lunch Program to agree that ketchup is not a vegetable. But all of these solutions are within the framework that it is the job of a school supported by the government to provide lunch. So the question I want to ask is, what happens if we let go of that idea and, and we stop assuming that the school and the government is part of the solution to our problem? What if we asked ourselves what the free market might come up with in terms of a solution? That's our theme about the unknown knowns. So before I show you another idea, I want to free your minds a little bit by taking you on a trip outside the US and outside the school system to a very creative solution providing lunches in another place. This gentleman is in the city of Mumbai in India, which has a population of 19 million people, over 20 times the size of Boston, the sixth largest city in the world. And there are hundreds of thousands of office workers in the city of Mumbai who have a cultural affinity 
for a reasonably sophisticated hot meal at lunchtime. And culturally, wives, mothers, grandmothers, for the most part, are willing and able to prepare those meals uh, in the morning. But how do you get those meals to the office workers at lunchtime? This gentleman is the answer. He is a Tiffin Dabawala. So he's one of 4,000 lunch delivery men, they're all guys, uh, in Mumbai, that's part of an elaborate system that has arisen to pick up from a home or from a local lunch service a hot meal in the late morning and navigate the very intricate train system in Mumbai, getting it through various train stations and delivering it to an office worker at the other end at lunchtime, hot and ready to eat. Uh, and they have a very high delivery accuracy because the logistics of this are sort of overwhelming when you think about a city of 19 million people. It's even more impressive when you realize that many of these men can't read. And so the containers, which are called Tiffins, have an elaborate system of codes to help them figure out what train stations and what office buildings the lunches need to go to. The point is that they took resources and assets in their culture and their society and came up with a market solution to a lunch problem. So what do we have in 21st century America that could be a solution to providing lunches that doesn't depend on school and government? I want to give you a recipe for a lunch program that has four main ingredients and one, I think, pretty novel twist in the preparation. You ready? Tell me. <laughs> and it doesn't involve ketchup. Um, so the first thing uh, we really need in lunches, I hope I've convinced you, is we need choice. We need variety because we have allergies and we decided this week not to eat gluten anymore. And um, <laughs> we're really bored with um, uh, hot dogs and somebody else is allergic to peanuts so there are no nuts in the school. We need variety and as 21st century consumers, we're used to an e-commerce environment where we can have variety. Amazon trained us to think that we can have whatever we want. So what you need is an e-commerce system that is sophisticated enough to provide deep choice, but also to know things about our preferences and our needs that allow us to select things easily. So maybe a Netflix recommendation type system, right? So that's the first thing we need. We also need to know a lot more about the food we're eating, clearly. Otherwise, we're accidentally eating things like chemically treated cartilage and thinking it's hamburgers. Um, so we need... Um, a system that we can understand the ingredients in our foods. And fortunately, the FDA has standardized on nutrition labeling. We're all starting to recognize what this label can tell us about what we eat. And software now can take uh, a recipe and generate a label automatically and tell you what that food uh, quality and ingredients actually is. So two more important pieces to a new solution. This might be my favorite one. There are 10 thousand professionally licensed catering operations in the United States operating in the same communities as our schools. And these are people who care passionately about food. They make food for weddings and bar mitzvahs and business lunches. And they turn the lights on in their kitchens every day trying to make a great meal. And they're right down the street from the schools and the students that could benefit from that uh, energy around uh, food. We have another ingredient that we can take advantage of, and that is, I'm, I'm surprised you laughed at that. There are millions of parents out there that want part-time employment, what we call mother's hours. They want to work in the morning and then be free when young children get out of school. And many of them have SUVs and minivans that make perfect delivery vehicles for small packages and short routes. Okay? So four ingredients and one little twist in how we put that all together. And that is something that people are calling peer-to-peer -peer commerce or online marketplaces. Whatever you call it, it's been a fascinating explosion over the last couple of years in businesses that are serving uh, demand for something by gathering up fragmented or distributed sources of supply. So Airbnb is doing that, giving people rooms by finding uh, spare bedrooms in private homes. Uh, Lyft is doing it by using private drivers. So you put all that together, what can you get for a lunch service? You can get what I call a virtual lunch service, where the school is not responsible for providing the meal. The school isn't the target to be a, uh, a sitting duck customer 
for an Aramark or a Sodexo for some large fixed price contract that the school has to pay regardless of how many kids want to eat the food that's provided. The school just becomes a channel to allow people who need a lunch, students or staff, with outside sources that are willing to deliver that lunch. How it works, you take an intermediary that uh, agrees with the school to host a lunch service and adapts the lunch uh, menu to the schedule that the school has and any concerns that the school would have, like maybe a parochial school wouldn't want fish, I mean, wouldn't want uh, meat to be served on Fridays and Lent. You let parents and staff order from that menu directly from the intermediary. And you get licensed and contracted local caterers to prepare the meals with standard recipes and standard procedures so that you can have consistency across the experience. And then you get those soccer moms or soccer dads with their SUVs and you give them the opportunity to provide the delivery service. They go to a caterer near their home in the morning, start, pick up lunches and deliver it to a few schools uh, and they're done, obviously, by lunchtime, right? If you aggregate that offer across a lot of schools and a lot of parents and a lot of kids, you cre create enough volume that you can create lots of choice, which we want. And over time, you can build enough scale that the meals are actually affordable. Uh, this system today can make a meal cost between $4.50 and $6. That is more than a school lunch costs today, but a school lunch is subsidized with tax dollars and includes free food, quote unquote, right? And we know we can get that price down. Meanwhile, schools can take the subsidy they get from the school lunch program and divert it to this one in order to defray the expense for lower income families. So the system does work. What happens when you do this? Well, kids can eat better, right? They can get the variety they want. They can get the nutrition we want them to have. They can get things that respect their allergies and other preferences. Parents can be a lot happier. They sleep better because they have some involvement in the food their children are getting and they have some confidence about the caliber of what they're getting. Schools can actually teach better because if you take the job of providing lunch off the plate of a school, that means time, budget money, uh, space could be freed up to do a better job of its core responsibilities. And I would argue to you, the next generation of people inheriting this plan, that the society just works better. If we're supporting local businesses, we're not creating wasteful new sources of supply, we're leveraging what's already out there and we're helping each other take advantage of things that are already out there in the marketplace. You might want to know how I know all this. That would be a legitimate question to ask at this point. But my answer to that is I work with a fabulous team, including some amazing caterers, a culinary director, software architects, um, uh, who am I forgetting? Oh, the, mass, the wonderful delivery parents that work with us. And we are now supplying thousands of lunches a day to over 140 schools, daycare centers, and camps and we are feeding kids, kids with allergies, kids who keep kosher, kids who don't eat meat, um, kids who don't like mustard on their hot dogs, regular kids like my own, and we know that this works. Um, it's massively encouraging for us, and it means, I think, if we continue to scale this up and continue to improve on this uh, really interesting business model, that we can go from this to something that looks more like this. So I think that's what can happen when you look for the unknown knowns, challenge the way you provide a solution, um, and I hope you have a chance to do that in your own lives. And I thank you so much for listening to our solution. Thank you.